this Yankee team, which can't hit for average, run the bases, or play D, remind you of the 70s club of Reggie, Thurm, and Nettles? Not them. The teams composed of Jerry Kenny, Jake Gibbs, Johnny Ellis, and Horace Clark. Hi everyone, this is Will O'Toole welcoming you to an edition of Park Ridge Sports History, all things July 4th. And I uh, say happy birthday to the country on this great day, July 4th, where fireworks, hot franks, and baseball just pervade our whole day, our whole culture, plus parades and getting together for picnics, swimming, uh, just walking around in the park, whatever. And of course, we end the day uh, in many, many establishments, many towns in many states with the fireworks display that our towns, counties, or states uh, provide us. So it's a great holiday. It's probably one of my favorite days of all year, <laughs> and simply because uh, you don't have to do too much to enjoy the day. There's no last minute shopping. There's no great decorating unless, of course, you want to put the bunting on your house or raise your American flag or just decorate in all things colored red, white, and blue. But it's really just a day where you can just say, hey, Jim, you guys want to come over? We're going to have a barbecue about 4 o'clock. We can listen to the game on the radio and do all things. So you throw a couple of burgers, a couple of hot dogs on the grill, have a beer, and talk nothing but sports. And in this case, we move, as I always say, from the pub where we're having a beer and a hamburger to our uh, barbecue scene in someone's backyard. So everything is sports related. Everything we do is uh, talking of sports, usually of baseball. And why I bring up the 4th of July is this. Uh, sometimes, you know, and this is what Bill James and the metrics actually taught me. And that was the perception of something doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. And I, I can recall Bill James, and I listen, I'm not going to mention any player or any uh, sports reporter, but they would say something. And Bill James, in some of his books, if you ever got the, the old baseball abstracts from the early 80s, uh, he would actually take that nugget of information maybe that he heard on a broadcast and see if it was actually true by – doing some research on it. And many times Bill James found that the perception was wrong, that it was actually a myth, and that the facts that were quote unquote pervading the game or being part of the game were in fact untrue. And this really led to the revolution of metrics and analytics and all things statistics in baseball and in all other sports. That's why I brought up the Yankees in my cartoon this week, because I, I've always heard that, and I wanted to see how true it was about July 4th, and that being a uh, prognosticator of a team's chances of playing in the postseason. Now, well, it used to be, were they going to win the pennant? Now with so many teams now, uh, participating via the wild card and with all different divisions in baseball. Now it's, is it really a uh, prognosticator for postseason in baseball? Well, I did some research on it. I spent all of the yesterday, fortunately, sometimes when you get the bad weather in the summer, it kind of forces you indoors instead of sitting outside and cutting the lawn or just relaxing in, in, uh, in a beach chair listening to the ball game on the radio, but I am one of those nuts. I guess I do have too much time on my hand or whatever, but I was actually looking to see. And of course, here's my handy dandy little notebook that I, I carry around. I have about three or four of these. And actually uh, I should show this to Howard one day, but it has all of the shows or many of the shows and some of the information that I've compiled over a, uh, the year that I've been doing the show, which I, I really find it's a privilege. And I want to thank Howard and Park Ridge for allowing me to come into your homes and just talking anything and everything about sports. But I went through and I used baseball reference or baseball almanac. And I actually did find a couple other 
interesting baseball websites uh, this week. In fact, I've gotten in touch with a number of the editors and uh, would love to maybe potentially have kind of a dialogue on this show in the future. Anyway, I took all of the pennant winners. And of course, Baseball Reference has all of the box scores going all the way back to 1900. So it's a great, I, I mean, you have to give kudos whether you agree with uh, Bill James's assessment of players or you agree with his analysis or his mathematical formulas. One thing that Bill James had uh, or didn't have was really the luxury of this research at his fingertips. He did have what they called the baseball encyclopedia back in the early 70s, but that was really thumbing through pages. So they're really, you know, baseball has to have uh, a really a special thanks over the last 40, 50 years for all things metrics and really attributed uh, to Bill James and other people prior to that. But really, it was Bill James who revolutionized the game. And you could say maybe it's gone overboard with the launch angle and all the rest of it. But uh, he really developed a system. He developed a metrics that really, uh, really just improves the, not just the performance. Well, it can't improve the performance of the player. Well, it could if the player uses the information and uh, uses it and works with it to improve his, his batting or his pitching. But really, it has improved my appreciation of the game, but also it has changed the perspective of how we look at players. And I always think about one player my brother Eddie always brings up, and it's Daryl Evans. And uh, he is a player that would have really, really profited big, big time with the uh, – baseball analytics today because even though he didn't have a high batting average, I think he finished with a 249 average. And I've talked about him before on Park Ridge Sports. He had a phenomenal batting eye getting on base via the walk. Plus he had a big punch in his bat, uh, totaling over 400 home runs. I was always glad that he did play for a World Series winner in the Detroit uh, Tigers in 84. But he's a kind of guy that years ago we just didn't appreciate. And with analytics, you're saying, okay, the batting average isn't that important, but I've actually made mention that I think it's a little bit more important than people give uh, credence to today. Maybe they've gone a little bit uh, overboard on dismissing it. And I think that you're seeing more and more uh, back to an appreciation of batting average. And I'll tell you why. You can't have a good on-base percentage just by drawing walks. It's not going to happen. All right. And one of the guys who I think we can use right now is, is Kevin Biggio, who draws a ton of walks. He has struggled this year, uh, but of late his batting average has improved, but he's a guy who draws a ton of walks and his on-base percentage is, is over 300, probably over 350, but his batting averages this year has been really about 210, 220, it has affected his playing time. So you need to hit. You need to draw walks. You need to get on base, as uh, Billy Bean would say. You got to get on base. And there's two ways to get on base, walks or hits, uh, and do it in a high percentage so that you are valuable to your team. Anyway, that being said, I went through the stats all the way back, and I did discover this. And here's an interesting insight on this. I think the myth or the perception about being in first place in July or specifically on July 4th, does it lend credence to the fact that you're going to be playing in the postseason? Without a doubt, uh, in the early stages of baseball, when they only had two divisions of eight teams, the NL and the AL, it was uh, so, so uh, important to be in first place. I was just going through, I'm going to do the National League first. And I went from the very beginning, 1900, when the Brooklyn Robins were in first place on July 4th with a five-game lead over their closest opponent. Actually, from 1900 to 1911, a little bit more in the decade, 12 years, 12 baseball seasons, every team that was in first place on July 4th won the pennant. And it stretched actually until 1933 and 
every team up until 1933, with five exceptions, that was in first place on July 4th, won the pennant. And there was a stretch where uh, it went like 16 seasons. The first team, actually, and we're going to talk about them. We're going to save them for our second half because they are an exciting team, kind of interesting. And that is the first team not to be in first place that does win the pennant. Does it in, I, I tell you, classic novel, classic Hollywood form. They were actually in last place, and we're talking about the Boston Braves of 1914, who on July 4th were 15 games out of first place and rally and blow out the New York Giants uh, for, in September and actually go from being 15 games out to winning the pennant in the National League by 10 full games. We'll get into that, but real quick, they were mired – uh, in last place, they got off to a terrible start. And then they had, I was looking at this because I did the uh, statistics. They actually had not one, but two stretches where they won 25 of 31 games. And after July 4th, they really got revving. And they were just unstoppable in September. Just blew the Giants out. Actually, they were down to the Giants by six and a half games in late August and wind up making those games up and then beating the Giants by 10 games. Just an incredible stretch of, of time. So I do want to talk about them, but I do want to get into a little bit about uh, probably the other two teams, and that was the 64 Cardinals. Um, they were actually six, in sixth place, 10 full games out in 1964. And the reason I bring up the Cardinals – we talked about them a couple of weeks ago with the perfect game of Jim Bunning on Father's Day. And again, a post-Father's Day happy uh, welcome and happy Father's Day to those fathers in Park Ridge. But they were a full 10 games out in sixth place in uh, on July 4th, and they just overwhelmed the competition. In fact, I was looking. One of the reasons why is that on July 3rd, Bob Gibson, of course, their Hall of Fame great pitcher, had lost his sixth game of the season, and he was even at 500. He was 6-6 six and six, uh, on July 4th, and he finished the season 19-12. and 12. Basically, he wins 13 of his last 19 decisions to propel the, the Redbirds into the World Series. So that was really the stepping off point. But the Cardinals, you got to give them kudos. They actually went 54-29 and 29 over the last three months of the season because I'm going to say July 4th to August 4th, August 4th, September 4th, September 4th. Usually they play a couple of games in October. But the, the Cardinals were a full 10 games out on July 4th rally. They finish up 93 and 69. They were under 500 at 38 and 40 and basically go 54 and 29 over the rest of the season. 83 games, basically half the season. And of course, we got to talk about the New York Mets. And the reason why I, I like to, by the way, too, uh, both the Cardinals and the Braves were in one division at that time. So it was interesting that. Um, Overall, and let me just get this out. If you're in front or in first place in the National League on July 4th, where you went from being 79.5% of the time you won the uh, pennant from 1900 to 1933. So it was a winning clip of basically 80%, four out of five uh, times. Actually, they won 27. The teams that were in first place – uh, on July 4th, from the years 1900 to 1933, they won the pennant 27 times for a 79.5% winning percentage or percentage. After that, and this is, uh, there's a number of reasons for this, is uh, especially in the National League, it really does dip. And the National League, I think, is at 59.5% of the time that a team that's in first place on July 4th wins the pennant. But you can see how it's come down 
from 1934 until our present day, almost 100 years, and it went from 80% down to 60%. Really, now it's basically just doing the numbers, if I got it right. It's about 40% of the time. If you're in first place on July 4th, you win or uh, the, the pennant. Now, number of reasons. We have wild cards that are playing, and there are five teams that have won the World Series that were wild card teams, particularly the Miami Marlins, Florida Marlins, who were twice World Series champions, and twice they came from the wild card. And the San Francisco Giants of 2014 also accomplished that. Uh, another team that did it, well, and in fact, here's the thing. The first wild card World Series was the Giants versus the Kansas City Royals. So that kind of changed the whole uh, complexion of this um, fact. July 4th, if you're in first place, it's a good good chance you're going to be in, in uh, winning the pennant. Now it's we see now the National League has a 59.5% chance of you getting to the World Series. Notice what I said, to the World Series. Another factor, of course, the number of divisions. And, of course, baseball expanded in 1961 and 62 from eight teams to ten. And for a while there, and that's what makes kind of a cardinal, uh, kind of a, a pretty cool accomplishment. Uh, they were in sixth place out of ten teams. Even though the Braves were in dead last, 1914, it's still an accomplishment. All the teams were... Uh, established, yes, but still you have 10 teams in the National League and they come out of sixth place and win. Now the Mets are a little bit different. They're kind of a combination of both the Braves and the Cardinals. Why? They were in sixth place in 1973, like the Cardinals. However, like the Braves, they were in last place in their division, the NL East. And I think they were trailing at the time, more than likely the Pittsburgh Pirates. But anyway, the Mets in 73, ready for this, were in sixth place, a full 12 and a half games behind first place. And the reason why that season just sticks out is that I was really there. I can honestly say I, um, my father got us tickets to the game. It was the first time my sister Barbara ever went to a baseball game. And uh, the five of us, my, my two brothers, my sister, oh, and uh, my dad, we all went to the game, left my twin sisters behind with mom. I think they went shopping or something like that. But we were at a game down the right field line at Shea against the Dodgers. The Mets won the game in a walk-off fashion. I hate that. In their final at bat, 2-1. And then the next day, this was the fun part of my parents. I got to be honest with you. They would do some stuff out of nowhere. And we decided to go out to eat. And we went out early, like four o'clock. So it was kind of like a late lunch. My dad was a principal. So he had a couple of days off. He would take his vacation in August. It was a working vacation, paint the house, uh, fix up the yard, uh, clean out the gutters, you name it. I, my father was just amazing. They were just shout out to them. They were just an incredible, uh, Parent, they were just incredible parents that way. But anyway, four o'clock in the afternoon, all of us were home. My brothers were working, but we decided uh, they happened to have the day off. We had talked about the game last night. We were at the uh, the restaurant eating, and all of a sudden, said, somebody said, "Hey, you know, we should go to the game tonight." And at that time, if you are an old baseball fan, Met game started at eight o five. Here it is, like four thirty five o'clock. And all of a sudden, we thought it was a crazy idea. And all of a sudden, my father said, let's go. And this time, it was the entire family that trooped over the Shea. We had great seats in the mezzanine uh, loge just under. And I just remember it was, again, the Mets had won 2-1 in a walk-off fashion the night before. This time, I do believe uh, they were down by two runs in the ninth inning. They load the bases. And a, a pop-up was hit. To, I think Bill Russell, and I believe he dropped the ball and allowed two runs to come in, and the Mets win the ball game. 5 4. The place is going nuts. It's going nuts. Well, the next night, the Mets got beat by the Dodgers, but they were on their way. Here's what people don't remember is that the Mets were 12 and a half out on July 4th, but 
at the end of July, they were still double digits behind first place and still mired in sixth place. It's really incredible what they did. So um, they were a combination, sixth place like the Cardinals, last place like the Braves. They win the pennant. And actually, they had a bigger hump to overcome, unlike the Cardinals and the Braves, because now they win their division, but then they have to get by the mighty red, big red machine. And they do in five games. And then they go to a seventh game against the Oakland A's and lose in Oakland. So a game, well, the game six, if you're a real Met fan, you wonder if they they should have saved maybe Seaver uh, for the seventh game. Remember, he was working on short days rest. And I think Burrow thought, hey, this was my best shot to win this whole thing. Yeah, listen, I'll never go against guys like Yogi Berra. I, I think that he has a better sense of the game and his players than I ever will. But um, it was a shame that the Mets didn't win because it was a remarkable comeback. And, of course, my wife's favorite player, Wayne Garrett, had something to do, probably his best season for uh, the Mets. He had 15 home runs and 53 RBIs. It was just a, a real combination. And I, I can't go further. Yeah, I got to give uh, kudos to the Yankees because in 1978, they were 10 games behind the Boston Red Sox. Here's what I do recall. The Red Sox were making mincemeat out of the American League East. They were just obliterating, actually, the whole American League. Uh, if you recall, they had a, a ton of home run hitters. The year before, they had made the cover of Sports Illustrated. I think they, they set a record with 33 home runs in a small amount of games. They were just pounding the ball. Well, in 78, they uh, they were able to get Eckersley really in a groove. Uh, they were doing everything, just blowing everybody out. And the Yankees, of course, maybe coming down from 77, they had some injuries. But in 78, I'll never forget this. They were actually supposed to play the – uh, Red Sox on July 4th, and the game got rained out. It was a torrential rain. I, I think as soon as you woke up, they had canceled the game. And I always thought, even then, I was rooting for the Red Sox. I thought then that that was a killer. It, it hurt the Red Sox that they didn't play because I really felt that they had uh, the boot, so to speak, on the Yankees' neck. And I, I just knew they were going to win that game if they had played them on July 4th. Well, lo and behold, the games were supposed to be played in Fenway. When does that game get rescheduled? The weekend of what would become the Boston Massacre. I believe is that it was that Thursday night game that was the uh, makeup for the July 4th game. Because in, in 1978, ready for this, the Yankees were in second place, did not play because of postponement of the game. They were a full 10 games out of the Red Sox. And actually, that would increase as the month went on. And then they just played crazy ball the rest of the year. And, of course, the Red Sox didn't get the pitching. They did rally. you got to give the Red Sox uh, credit. They do rally to force the game, uh, you know, the extra game, the Bucky Dent game on October 2nd, 1978, to really uh, – <laughs> Unleashed quite a finale for that 78 season. It was a great baseball season. In Now, here's the whole point. And I think this, of all things, says it the most. Do you realize, I, I did, from 1901 to 1968, this is what I found, that in the American League, in those 68 baseball seasons that were played, 48 times that the team in first place on July 4th would win the pennant. Now, why did I stop at 68? Number of reasons. I probably could have done it with the National League, but I didn't see that same trend. Uh, and, and I'll get into that in a second with the Cubs rallying, uh, a number of teams, let's say, being in fourth place in the National League and going on. But um, even from 68 all the way to 81, Teams that were in first place, it can it, it continues. The Red Sox in 1967, Yaz's Triple Crown season, and of course, the Impossible Dream team. The Red Sox were in fourth place, a full four and a half, well, I always say a full, four and a half games behind first place. 
and I think in first place at the time might have been Detroit. Interestingly enough, um, the only other teams that break from first place uh, for a while there, actually, ready for this, you have the only team lower were the 06 and 07 Detroit Tigers and uh, Chicago White Sox. Actually, the 06 White Sox were in fourth place five uh, games out. And they won the pennant. The 07 Detroit Tigers were uh, in fourth place also, six and a half games out. And they win the pennant. And then Detroit does it again. In 08, they're in third place, this time only a game and a half behind. And they win. Boston again in 1916 were uh, in fourth place, three and a half out. But really, when I think about it, and I'm just looking at this, really no one was with the exception of the Philadelphia Athletics, who were six, or Detroit in two thousand uh, in, in 1907, pardon me, nobody was uh, double digits behind. And that's what makes that 78 season with the Yankees so incredible. Baltimore, in, well, I shouldn't say that. The Yankees were 10 out. I don't see any other team being double digits in terms of being out and winning the whole thing. With the exception, I, I have to look this up again. Baltimore in 83 was in second place, 10 games behind at the uh, at the All-Star break, uh, 1983. If you recall, uh, 1983, the All-Star game was played July 6th. So basically, baseball had the July 4th weekend off. Terrible marketing, terrible decision by baseball. Um but that was the only other time that I've seen, okay? So really, that 78 season by the Yankees was really incredible. And being 10 games out now, yes, it was two divisions. But now the Yankees win. Then they go to the, got to go to Kansas City the next day after beating Boston in Boston for the extra game. And really a remarkable season by the 78 Yankees. Really, when you start looking at all this, when you start to realize, wow, some of these teams that do win the pennant that weren't in first place, it wasn't a uh, a gargantuan lead by the first place team that they had to overcome. Even in the National League, like I said, St. Louis, 10 out. Uh, the Boston Braves, 15 out. The Mets, 12 and a half out. You don't really see it. 1930, the Cardinals were in fourth place, a full six games out. The New York Giants in 36 five and a half games out, and in fifth place, they win the pennant. But mostly, you could actually say this then, and probably it is not a myth about July 4th, that in order to win or get into postseason, I would actually say you have to really be within three or four games of the division leader. Now, how can that help? Well, take a look at today's July 4th standings, and you can basically say which teams are probably going to be already uh, working towards next year. Which teams do you think will be maybe unloading salary or aging players to a pennant contender and get rid of them? Yes, you could say, well, with more teams being involved in the wild card and all the rest of it, but uh, that has changed, so to speak. Yes, it has, but not by much. Because as I say, I can even look from 2000 on, uh, the only teams I can – I can honestly say uh, maybe the Houston Astros, they were in third place, 12 and a half games behind the pace, but they qualified as a wild card. Florida, 10 and a half out in fourth place in 03. They qualified. They do win the World Series, uh, but they were 10 and a half out. San Francisco in 02, minus four and a half wild card. But those are really the only teams that I, I discovered. And, of course, I'm just doing a good uh, a glance over this. But uh, that you can say still had a shot. But even so, uh, with the exception of Florida 10 and a half and, and Houston 12 and a half behind, most teams are within I, – I really like to think that three to five game. I'll even say that. I'll expand it to five games. They're within that five games. And really when you think about it, that's one week that you can gain on the leader. If they have a bad run, lose four out of five, and you happen to win four out of five, you've cut the gap, so to speak. All right? So 
it is interesting. And uh, I, I did mention about uh, some earlier teams. Overall, like I said, it's 59.5 in the National League that wins. I believe in the American League, it comes down to 70.6% who are in first place and uh, win the pennant. Remember what I said, win the pennant. That's a pretty good pretty good uh, statistic. So you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> the interesting thing, I was talking about Detroit in 07 and 08 being four in fourth place and in third place, respectively. Well, they were one of the few teams that actually break, ready for this, both the New York Yankees and their monopoly on first place on July 4th, the Philadelphia A's and their monopoly on first place on July 4th. Detroit in 34 and 35, back-to-back seasons, just like 07 and 08, they are in second place, one game out and two games out, and win the division. Then they go to 1940, Detroit, and they're in second place again. Again, just one game out, and they win the pennant. Kind of phenomenal for a team that went from basically uh, 1940 to about 1968 without winning a pennant. And the three years that they do prior or the five years that they do prior to that or in five years that uh, they win, they had to come from, uh, you know, second or third place and that they were behind on July 4th. Kind of just interesting stuff about the uh, histories of the team. One thing I did learn, boy, oh, boy, if the Yankees get (laughs) the Yankees don't blow leads, let me tell you. Yankee fans, maybe this is why they are seen as very uh, spoiled, rotten fans. (laughs) And I'm one of those guys who feels that way because there are days when I think that Yankee fans uh, just don't give the franchise enough credit for what they accomplish. And the only way you can appreciate this is if you look at what the Yankees did, probably at the height of uh, their greatness. And I'm talking about the 20s the 30s, so you're talking about Ruth and Gary, you're talking about the Maggio and Burra. Uh, If they're in first place on July 4th, boy, oh boy, you can start uh, reserving some World Series tickets. Even this, even in the 60s, the Yankees were in second place, strangely enough, three games out uh, in 1964 and win the pennant. Uh, They were behind, actually, in 61 and 62 in second place by a game and by half a game. And they come and win the pennant. So they've started to do some things that way. And then I was just looking at this. The Yankees, 76 through 78. Well, I told you that they were uh, 10 games out in 78. But 76 and 77, they were in first place by nine games in 76 and by a game in 77. Actually, that 77 season was a pretty exciting uh, pennant race a, a, as well. And then the Yankees during their greatness of the Derek Jeter, you know, the core four, ready for this, 98, they're in first place by 11. 99, they're in first place by three games. 2000, they're in second place, game and a half behind. 2001, they're in first place by half a game. And then in 03, the Yankees are a full three games in front, interestingly enough. And in, I, I will tell you this, even in 81, the Yankees actually, people don't remember this, Yankees are actually in first place, two games in front. And, of course, that was the year that they had split uh, pennant winners. So uh, Bowie Kuhn decided bring baseball back. August the 11th or 12th, let's just say. And they played from August 12th to the end of the year. And whoever was in first place in those respective divisions would go to the playoffs. And they said whoever was in first place prior to the strike would go to the playoffs. There were two teams that really got hurt by that decision, St. Louis and Cincinnati. They had the best records of any teams, national and American, over the full season. Yet, neither one got to the postseason. It would have been interesting to see how baseball would have been changed had those two teams uh, been able to go. Because when you think about it, um, does Whitey Ball really evolve? Do the Reds 
uh, have one more in their pocket to win a whole, uh, you know, World Series? And could they have met maybe the Yankees that year? So it's interesting. So when they talk about being in July 4th in first place, yes, you can say without a doubt that you're in good shape, at least in the American League, with a 70 percent uh, uh, rating of going to the World Series and a 59.5 percent chance of going to the World Series in the National League. And speaking of which, I'm just going to turn the last eight minutes. I got to talk about this Boston Brave team because without a doubt, I thought they were the most exciting of all uh, the teams that were <laughs> really mired deep in the pits of the standings on July 4th who come out of nowhere, all right? We had the 35 Cubs and the 36 Giants who rally, and they played great baseball. And even the 38 Cubs, you know, I was even looking at this again. Those Cub teams in the early part of the century were really good ball clubs who could win clutch games. The Cubs, for instance, three straight, four out of five years from 06 to 1910, they're in first place and win the uh, National League pennant on July 4th. They were uh, four and a half up, 11 and a half up, half a game up. And then they're a game and a half up and they win all, uh, you know, their pennants. Then 35, 38, 45, and then that's it. They just hibernate the Cubs. We don't hear from them again. So I would love to know really what happened making the Cubs. And yes, we know it was the goat curse and all the rest of it. But it would be interesting to see why they just went nowhere. And it is cyclical. I, I understand that. But as they fell, you notice the St. Louis Cardinals, their probably most hated rival, ascend. It's kind of interesting. Anyway, that Boston Brave team, 1914, just to give you an idea, they were uh, run by a guy named George Stallings, who was under 500, but did have quite a few years in the major leagues. That year, they were 94, 59, and 5. And uh, I just want to tell you this. That team, that 1914 team, they were, they started the season 12 and 28. So they actually finished 82 and 31, plus a four game sweep of the Philadelphia A's in the World Series. Kind of incredible. The team, though, I was looking at it. Uh, I always thought that they were just a terrible bunch that were able to, let's say, piece together rallies and get clutch pitching and all the rest. Of it. Actually, their season wasn't all that bad. They finished out of an 18 league. They were third in runs per game. They were third in home runs. They were eighth in stolen bases. All right, so they were dead last, but they were first in walks. This is definitely a money ball team. Batting average, they were tied for fourth. On base percentage, tied for third. They were sixth in triples. Something Moneyball really doesn't accentuate is triples because they're, it, the big fear is, uh, and obviously it was, and we've said it before, don't get thrown out of third base if you're the first out of the inning. Don't get thrown out of third base if you're last out. I don't know why it's okay to get thrown out of third base if you're the second out in the inning. Don't know why, but that was always what we were preached uh, and coached. They were second in doubles and fourth in hits. So not really a bad team that way. Uh, you could say middle of the pack, but not anything deadly where they just couldn't hit or they got shut out, let's say, 15, 16 times. And if, you know, they gave up a, a host of uh, runs early, the pitching staff, that they had no chance to win. So they were second in run scored. They actually scored 657 runs uh, for the year. They actually did this. They actually played the most games of any team. So they had quite a few ties. So that might have added to their runs uh, scored. But you know what? I'm, I'm going with this. Here's the interesting thing. 
They had the youngest hitters in the league, 25.7. And I think that does come to help them out. Now, they're pitching fourth in the ERA. Not bad. They were second in shutouts with 18. Dead last in saves with only six. So you know that Stallings was probably using his guys uh, for the entire game. Second in innings pitched. Interestingly enough, but I'll get into this because Bill James talks about this a lot. They were second in home runs and sixth in walks. So they gave up a ton of walks and gave up uh, a ton of home runs. But I have a feeling that in terms of ERA being fourth, I have a feeling, and of course I can't prove this right now, I guarantee you that they didn't give up a lot of walks with the home runs hit. And that is something that James has always said, uh, that he doesn't worry about teams that give up a lot of walks or a lot of home runs, just as long as the walks and the home runs don't come together uh, or, or words or meanings to that effect, because that was the success of Hunter. Catfish Hunter never walked anybody, gave up a ton of home runs, kind of like Fergie Jenkins, but they're always solo shots. Anyway, interesting thing about this team. None of them really had career years, but they do get aided and helped by two future Hall of Famers, Rabbit Marinville, who was 22 years old and was really uh, a gold glover or perceived as a gold glover, and a guy by the name of Johnny Evers who comes over after threatening to go and jump to the Federal League. He doesn't have uh, – he's never known for his hitting – known for his, his uh, defense and for his leadership. He actually won the MVP that year and beat out Robin Marionville and another Boston Brave. Interesting. And that whole team, and I will get into this maybe next week. There is a guy I'd love to talk about a little bit by the name of Red Smith, who is acquired. I've already talked to you about how the Braves actually won 25 of 31 games on two separate occasions during their stretch and that they rallied from six and a half down to the Giants and blow them out, win the pennant by 10. But they are aided over the last 60 games by a guy by the name of Red Smith, who was acquired from Brooklyn, kind of didn't get along with their manager, comes to the Braves, Stallings revs up his confidence He's the leading hitter over the last 60 games that he plays with the Boston Braves, but unfortunately gets injured, a season-ending injury late in the season against the Brooklyn Dodgers and doesn't appear in the World Series. But he does help the Boston Raves become the Wonder Raves, the Miracle Braves of 1914, who on July 4th were in eighth place, a full 15 games behind, and rally to win the pennant and sweep the great Philadelphia A's in the World Series of 1914. This is Willow Tool for Park Ridge Sports. Thanks everyone for joining me again. I appreciate allowing me to come into your room and talk everything uh, baseball. Have a great four. Bye now.